Assalamu alaikum brothers, sisters and friends Welcome to a new episode of the GDM show The Global Dao Movement show We're back today with brother Hamza Assalamu alaikum Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh How are you? Good to see you bro Excellent So uh, last week we did episode 1 of Why you can't claim scientific miracles in the Quran And what we showed was that If you claim scientific miracles in the Quran You undermine the Quran itself Not right. only do you undermine the Quran But you undermine science, science Because yeah. you're assuming that science is static And it's never going to change Yes So that was one of the points basically, right? So maybe you want to touch upon them quickly before we move on Yeah, the first point was that you can't use science to prove the Qur'an because science is changing Right Okay, yeah. if you go into the philosophy of science On any level To any academic You will see that science is not supposed to be static There are no Moses tablets Right If you look at the works of Elliot Sober, Alex Rosenberg, Stathis Psilos Goch and others, you see that science is changing because we're always going to have a future observation that might that may undermine previous conclusions, right. yeah. which was based on previous limited observations. If you look into the induction, the problem of induction, you look into empiricism, we see that they have a scope, that they're limited, that you can always maybe have a future observation that's going to deny previous conclusions. So, you know, science is beautiful, it's supposed to change, it's yep. supposed to evolve <laughs> from right. that perspective, right? So how can you use a transient method, a time-bound method, to basically justify something that we consider to be timeless? Yes. It, it just doesn't work. It's a methodological inconsistency here. And this is why every time you say that there is a miracle in the Quran, a scientific miracle in the Quran, and you say that this is the science and this is the meaning from the Quran, then you've done two things, two assumptions that you've basically assumed. One, that this science is never going to change. And two, that this is the meaning that was intended by Allah. Right? This was the meaning intended by Allah. And that's can the you, only meaning. Can, and that's the only meaning. Can you prove these two things? Not necessarily, because many of the... The words describing natural phenomena are not really explained by anything else other than going into the Arabic language itself, which has many layers of meaning. How do you know that is the particular meaning that was intended by Allah? Sure. And also, when you look at the science, can you really say this science is a fact and will never change? You can't. Right, yeah. You can't because the beauty of science is that you can have future observations that sure. deny previous conclusions. So that was number one. The other was that. The other one was that they claim that the Prophet ﷺ could have never have accessed other civilizations to have access knowledge that was scientifically crude yep. but true. That's not true yes. <laughs> because the Prophet ﷺ, as established by his own sunnah, by his own way, you could find this in the prophetic traditions in Sahih Muslim that he looked into the Persians and Romans yep. to see if he could basically allow his companions to cohabit with the wives that were breastfeeding. Yes. And he found it was okay for the Persians and Romans, therefore he concluded it's okay for his companions. Yep. So therefore you can't claim that he didn't have access to other civilizations sure. with regards to their knowledge, scientific and medical. The other assertion that we made was that you can't say that the verses in the Qur'an that talk about natural phenomena talk about natural phenomena in a way that no one else spoke about that's not correct either because many of the verses that talk about natural phenomena relate to knowledge that was in existing previous to the Qur'an sure. yep. for example the Greeks, the Sumerians, the ancient Egyptians, Egyptians. Yep. for example there's a so-called miracle claim that iron was sent down from heaven Yes. because Allah says iron was sent down that's true scientifically in some meteorites you have iron ore from that perspective it was sent down but is it miraculous? no because you had the ancient Egyptians I believe 1200 years before the revelation of the Quran that called iron by and pet which means iron from heaven. Yes. So we gave many examples in Sumerian literature, in in, in Greek sure. philosophy and thinking and in the Egyptians to show that that information was already available. Okay. okay? Now it doesn't mean the Quran borrowed. It yeah. doesn't mean the Quran is not true. We're not saying that. We're just saying that you cannot make the claim that it's a Quran. That it's a scientific miracle. Okay, good. So I mean, if they want more detail, you brothers, sisters, and guys watching can go to the first episode. Yes. And they can watch it. We'll put a link in the description box. Moving on swiftly, I've got a few questions for you today. Is that and it's to do with the new approach. Yes. Right. It's a multi-layered approach to the Quran that we're we're offering instead of these miracles, and it's far more profound in many ways. It right? is profound. It allows people to basically do do to do tadabbar on the Quran. To to ponder upon the Quran, yes, it doesn't give you like here's a miracle, it's not like fireworks and angels coming down, yeah. but it actually is 
is more warm in a way it's more, it allows you to really have a relationship with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to really ponder upon its verses because Allah says Afala yatadabburun al-Qur'an do they not reflect upon the Qur'an or are there locks on their hearts so from this perspective the more pondering we do the more our hearts may become unlocked to receive the mercy and guidance of Allah now this is not only the multi-layered approach it's called the multi-leveled approach as well so what does the multi-layered and multi-leveled approach mean? very simple the Qur'an uses a word for a description of a particular natural phenomenon. Yep. Okay, that word has many layers of meaning because we know the Arabic language is rich. It doesn't have an infinite number of meanings, but it has a scope, according to the classical dictionaries as preserved in the early centuries of Islam. So you have many layers of meaning. Each layer of meaning addresses different levels of understanding over time. Right. Okay. This is very profound. So the Qur'an uses a word with many layers of meaning and each layer of meaning addresses different levels of understanding over time which is more in line with what the Qur'an is supposed to do because the whole raison d'etre, the reason for existence if you like for many of these verses concerning natural phenomena are there to make you think about the fact that Allah deserves to be worshipped there's yeah. wisdom in the universe if you look at the classical exegesis be scholarly about this not many of the tafasir, the exegetical works, actually spoke about scientific miracles or nuances. Many of them said that's not the job of the verses. Yes. The job of the verses is to make you, for you to do your own reflection, to conclude that Allah deserves to be worshipped and there's wisdom in the universe. Not that there's something very specific about the kind of words that are used and correlating it with with, with, yeah. with the scientific findings. No, because science changes over time. It's there just to act as a signpost, a right. signpost to divine wisdom, a signpost to, to, to the worship of the divine. So, okay, that's excellent. Now, that's a, that's a very powerful claim. Now, give us some examples to back that claim up. Oh, there's many examples to back this claim. For example, let me give you one, the orbits. The Quran in chapter 21 verse 33 says, And it is he who created the night and the day and the sun and the moon, all in an orbit are swimming. Swimming, and the Arabic word you'd used here is yasbahuna, swimming. Now think about the multi-layered, multi-leveled approach. So, take one layer of meaning which means swimming. It addresses a level of understanding in the 7th century, which was understood just looking at the cosmos with the naked eye. If you have a desert Arab looking to the night sky, seeing the moon move, Looking at the sun, looking at the sun move, the constellations are changing all the time, and all of these things. He understands that these celestial objects are swimming in the ocean of space. Mm. It's not a miracle, but it does its job. It's there to get the seventh-century mindset, this particular level of understanding, to reflect on the phenomenon, to conclude that Allah deserves to be worshipped because who put them there? Who created the physical causes in the universe for that to happen? Mm. It must be the divine mind, if you like, right? The all-knowing being, yeah? And he therefore he deserves to be worshipped. However, continuing with this multi-layered and multi-leveled approach, even the word yasbahuna can relate to a 21st century understanding. That's not only swimming, but it's orbit, sure. celestial mechanics. Do you see? Yep. It still doesn't mean it's a miracle, but it means that it still can address our understanding of the reality. Right. And that's the point. It's not supposed to give you how these orbits work and the nature of these orbits and the scientific nuances of these orbits and celestial mechanics, but it points you to that direction so you can reflect and therefore you can conclude, wow, there's something going on in the universe. Allah deserves to be worshipped. Now, at this, and this is why Mustan Sirmir, who's a professor of Islamic studies at Youngstown State University, he also makes this point, he advocates this multi-layered, multi-leveled approach. And he says, the word yasbahuna, swim or float, in the verse, and it's the verse that we just mentioned, made good sense to 7th century Arabs observing natural phenomena with the naked eye. Right. It is equally meaningful to us in light of today's scientific findings, i.e. celestial mechanics. Mm. So he's trying to say, look, there's a word here, has different layers of meaning, and it addresses different levels of understanding. Now, one would argue, but this verse also is talking about the sun having its own orbit. Doesn't that mean that the Quran is wrong because referring to the fact the 7th century primitive understanding that the sun was going around the earth? No, 
Don't read into the Quran. Allow the Quran to speak for itself. Because many people do this. You have atheists and skeptics saying, Oh, why would I believe in a book that says that the sun goes around the earth? Hey, you've done that reading, not the Quran. Yes. Allow the Quran to speak for itself. Don't have presuppositions. But when we apply this approach to this verse, we see maybe it was addressing the level, so multi level, the level of understanding with the 7th century Arab, which probably they thought that the sun was going around the earth. But that very fact itself will still instill some kind of awe and evoke an understanding that someone is doing that and there's a divine wisdom in the universe. But at the same time, it can also mean that the sun has it has its own orbit and movement, not necessarily around the earth, yes. but it just has its own orbit. Yep. And that's actually true from a perspective of another level, which is the 21st century level of understanding. Right. Because we now know the sun does have its own orbit. It orbits the Milky Way and it takes 226 million years to do so. So just before we move on, there's a contention that can be made here. That is, what you're saying is that the, the Quranic verses have many layers of meaning, yes. many levels of meaning. So they make sense to someone in the past and in the present and in different contexts. Yes. Someone may say, well, what you're saying... By the way, yes. I'm only referring to natural phenomena. Right. Because if you study the sciences of tafsir, of exegesis, you can't change the meaning. Yes. Because if you have hadith, a prophetic tradition, the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace explaining a verse, you can't go beyond that. Right. If you have an ijma'a of the ulama, for example, consensus of the scholars, yes. or of their students, or whatever the case may be, many people know the sciences of tafsir. You can't change meaning. Yeah. We are talking about the verses that do not have scholarly consensus, do not have the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he's explaining them per se. Sure. That's in where you have to refer to the linguistics, the language, go to pre islamic poetry, whatever the case may be, to find out what was the linguistic understanding of this meaning. Because yeah. there is a difference between linguistic understanding and, and Islamic Sharia understanding. Yeah. And so, but once you exhaust all the other sources, which is the consensus, which is the prophetic traditions, the Prophet Muhammad upon whom, upon whom be peace explaining the verse. Yeah. If you don't have any information from these sources, then you have to rely on the language. Okay. So that's what we're talking okay, about. Okay, but yeah. the, the specific contention I was talking about was, someone may say, well, you're saying that a word or a verse may have multiple meanings, Yes, right? it's true. Yeah. And they say, well, what you're doing in, in actual fact, well, the verse may have, and this is a contention that's made, that may yes. have, you an endless amount of meanings and whatever happens in reality you just correlate with the Quran no, it's just no, convenient that's, that's not true because we're going to discuss this at the end as yes. well because there are some verses which you can't correlate to science at all right. <laughs> but it doesn't mean the Quran is wrong right. it might mean the, the, that, that science will catch up yes. or that it, it's, it's, a, it's a way of motivating the reader to do more science sure. but that's not the point the point here is no one is claiming there's an infinite, num infinite exactly, number of yeah. meanings for a particular word yes, yeah. there's a scope of meaning yep. for example we're going to discuss this now the word alaka has like around five meanings yep. it doesn't have 200 yep. that's five do you yep. see my point so it has a scope of meaning right okay excellent carry on, let's carry on. so this so let's give the let's, let's talk about case study now right. right let's use the word alaka now the word alaka can be found in many places in the quran specifically in chapter 23 verse 14 and it's to describe the development of the of the human being many people think this is the, this is embryology right now, the word alaka has five major meanings according to many dictionaries like Lane's Lexicon, Lisan al Arab, and many others. One of the meanings is blood in a general sense. Number two, a blood clot. Number three, clay that stick, sticks to the hand or clings to the hand. Number four, something that clings. Number five, a leech or a worm. These are established meanings, and we know they're established meanings as well because even 9th century Greeks who tried to translate the Quran even used the word leech in the Greek language to describe the word alaka in the Quran. So there was a kind of linguistic environment that these meanings were popping up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so there's those five meanings. Now let's apply our approach, the multi-levered, multi-layered multi and multi-leveled approach. It's a big tongue twister, I apologize. So from a seventh century perspective, we know that many of the Arabs and the people around that peninsula around that time adopted a Greek understanding. That's that's the best inference we can make because you had the Greek physician, second century physician Galen, he wrote the works on semen and, and other works concerning medicine and embryology and the development of the human being and they were translated in Egypt and you could find them I believe in Alexandria in the 6th century I believe. Right. You even had them in Iraq 
And so therefore, surrounding that environment, you had a Galenic or Aristotelian Greek understanding of these things, right? That's the best inference to make, especially when we know that they were traders and they exchanged knowledge, right? So the 7th century Arab most probably thought the embryo to be a blood clot. Mm. Now, this is not necessarily wrong from a naked eye perspective when you have natural abortions, which are called miscarriages, especially around day 20 to 40 or something. The embryo looks like a, a, a blood clot, basically. It's a fleshy, bloody filled thing, right? Especially day 20 to 25. Now, that's exactly what Galen wrote about, the Greek physician in the second century. He wrote the book on semen. And he used the words sarcoides, which in Greek means fleshy, and emados, which means bloody. There's right. another word he used, which means filled, but I forgot what word he used. So basically, he's describing the embryo at a certain position, certain time, as a bloody, fleshy, bloody, clot. fleshy, bloody filled thing, right? It's like a blood clot. Right. Okay. And the word alaka means blood in a general sense, or a blood clot. Yep. So if the 7th century Arab had the understanding, that layer of meaning is in line with his understanding, sure, yep. right? And it's not there to give you details about embryology, it is ridiculous. It's there to evoke awe and say, wow, who created the laws in the universe that enables this bloody mess, this blood clot, yep. this bloody fleshy thing to turn into someone like me? Yep. Whoever did that is all-knowing exactly. and deserves worship. worship. Yeah, Do you see? Course, yeah. That's the that's the narrative the Quran wants. It doesn't want you to think, here, here's a scientific textbook, here's all the embryology. Yeah. No, because we, re we already know that if you do that, you get yourself in a big mess, yeah. right? So that's the 7th century understanding. And there's lots of pictures that you can see online and offline and in the textbooks that, you know, it looks like a bloody, fleshy filled thing, right? Now, it's also appropriate for our time. So take another layer of its meaning, which is leech or worm. Right. And take the level of understanding that we have now, because we have the microscope, it was developed in the 15th century, discovered in the 15th century, and use it, and you see around day 20 to 25, or day 20 to 30, <coughs> 22 to 30, you see that the, the embryo looks like a... Like a blood clot, basically. like a leech, like a leech, a leech or a leech worm. Yeah. That's why Dr. Dale Lehman describes it as a worm. Even P.Z. Myers, the atheist critic, academic, he even describes it as a worm. Yeah. Maybe it was a sip of a tongue, but it's it's in it's in his, it's one of his old blogs. Well, that's what it looks like. If you look well, at it, it looks like yeah, it just looks like a a leechy thing, a, yeah. a wormy thing. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is when you use the microscope and you look at the embryo at that stage, day 22 to 25 or something, you see it looks like a leech or worm. Not only that, not only the external features, but if you were to di dissect a medicinal leech, you see that it still looks like a leech or a worm at, at, at that similar stage. So the point here is, maybe it means that Allah knows, God knows, right? But the point is, we're not saying there's anything miraculous here. We're not saying that, we're just doing tadabur, reflection. Now, so therefore, what, we can, what we've shown so far is, if you take the different layers of meaning, they address different levels of understanding. Right. 7th century and a 21st, 21st century. century. What I like to do, though, is not only focus on an empirical biological paradigm, I like to focus on a spiritual paradigm. Sure. Because there's another aspect to looking at these verses, it's not even to look at it from a scientific perspective, it's to look at it from a timeless, non-scientific perspective, a spiritual perspective. Because maybe Allah is describing us as literally just like leeches, that we were parasites in our mother's womb. Because yeah. what a leech does, you put a leech on your hand, it will just suck the blood, it will just drain your resources, oh. And it will just roll off and it's had a nice day, right? It, it's taken what it needs and it's drained your blood. It's a parasite. The embryo is no different. Fine, it doesn't suck the mother's, the maternal blood, but it does raid her blood in order to get what it wants. Sure. That's why mothers have to eat not only for the baby, but for themselves to keep healthy because the baby is going to take what it wants. There's this parasitic relationship. So from a spiritual perspective, an emotional perspective, it's going to make us realize Hey, you were like a parasite. Lower the wing of humility to your mother. Be more compassionate. If it wasn't for her, you won't be here. You are dependent. You're not self-sufficient. And also, she willingly and willfully gave herself her resources f so you could be born. Mm. Because she could have stopped. She could have said, I don't want this baby anymore. Or she could have said, God knows what she, want, she could have done. The point is, she willingly and willfully allowed her body to be used by you yeah. in a parasitical way. Because you drained her resources. This should make you feel, oh my god, 
I should love my mother more, I should respect her more and I'm not self-sufficient, I'm dependent on my mother and therefore ultimately dependent on God. But yeah. wow. Do you see? That's very a more powerful. of a spiritual insight. You know what's very interesting? Professor of Science Lord Robert Wilson, he's an emerita, emeritus professor of fertility studies at Imperial College in a documentary and we'll give you the link for you to see this. Look what he said, or hear what he said. He said, the leech takes whatever it needs to live by sucking the blood of whatever it, whatever it can latch onto. In that case, it's, that's me. He had a, a leech on his hand. As it sucks my blood, it takes from it all that it needs to live. It literally lives off me in the whole of pregnancy shaped by a similar kind of parasitic relationship. Unlike the leech, the developing embryo doesn't suck the maternal blood, but it does raid her blood for the raw materials it needs to grow. From the word go, both leech and embryo are out for themselves. Oh. So from this perspective, you can see there's many layers of meaning and it addresses different levels of understanding. Sure. A non-scientific understanding, a 21st century understanding, and a 7th century understanding. So not supposed to give you details. It's supposed to point you to those directions. The book of signs. It's supposed to say to you, look at that sign. Conclude whatever you want about that sign concerning its scientific details. Yeah. But what's weaving itself through that understanding is the ultimate conclusion that there's wisdom in the universe and that God deserves to be sure. worshipped. Because the point is, God wants to speak to the 7th century man, the 50th century man, and the 21st wow. century man. Not just us, right? So from this perspective, this is a new approach. It doesn't claim miracle, but it's profound because it gets people to do tadabbur, to ponder upon the Qur'an. The Qur'an says, do they not ponder upon this Qur'an or the locks on their hearts? Yeah. Which in a way can mean that the more pondering you do, the more your heart becomes unlocked to receive His guidance and mercy. Now, there is a final contention because, as we just mentioned, that they may say there's no science for some of the verses. Some of the verses that it mentions cannot be justified scientifically at all. So, what do we say to this? Well, it's very simple. No one is claiming that every single verse relating to natural phenomena, phenomena must be scientifically understood. Maybe it has a non-scientific non meaning, like a spiritual meaning. Like we've seen in the previous yeah. example. Or it could be relating to a scientific understanding that we don't know of yet, right? Yep. Or it could be a perspective that we haven't understood yet. The point is, maybe science will catch up. Why do you think that science and revelation always have to agree with each other? If that's the case, then the 19th century Muslim would have a huge problem. Because yep. in the 19th century, they believe that the universe never began, but the Quran says the universe began, so what do you do? Yep. So from this perspective, yes, there can be many cases where science contradicts the Quran. And the point here is, Big deal. Yeah, <laughs> that's it's, it. It's, Science is gonna change. Yeah, some of it Maybe our understanding of the Quran is not good enough. You know, these things are are grey in in many instances. Yes. I mean, if you look even at the classical exegetical works, even the scholars disagreed on certain realities. This is the beauty of the Quran. Just ponder. Yes, there could be a contradiction. Big deal. Yeah. We know science changes. So, we haven't got the full scientific conclusion yet. Even if we believe it's 99% true, there could be paradigm shifts. We know this in the history of science. And also, the Qur'an, how do you know that is the meaning of the Qur'an? How do you know you're doing the right... And how do you know you have the right understanding of the Qur'an? It could, it could be talking about something that's non-empirical. Yes, yeah. yes, it may even talk about uh, something that seems to be empirical, but maybe it has a spiritual meaning. Sure. We don't know. The right. point here is though, that's the beauty of the Qur'an is supposed to get you to think and to ponder further. And that's why the Qur'an was understood by the early Muslims and it encouraged them to do more science. Like Ibn al-Haytham, who's known to be the first scientist, according to David C. Lindbergh, a historian of science, he wrote, he wrote the book on optics. And in his autobiography, if you like, he said, I wrote the book of optics, which was the first manifestation of the formal scientific method. I wrote this because I was encouraged by the Qur'an. The Qur'an pointed me to these realities. Didn't give him details, yep. but it pointed him, just look. Look how God makes things work, right? Yep. And it encourages them to do more science. So Muslims should love science, should do more science. Shouldn't have a problem if science contradicts the Qur'an. That's yes. not a problem either, because we know science can change. Yep. And it encourages us to see the Qur'an in a different way. And, you know, the Qur'an is primarily a book that is there for us to conclude that God deserves to be worshipped. Not sure. that there's any details in this in, in these sciences or the details in these verses rather. So 
I don't know. Any other questions, no, bro? I, th I think you've covered it really well. We have gone I mean, over time. I mean, th it. there is more questions, yeah. and we will address them in the yeah, future. Of course, because the essay you, we're going to link. Yeah, you, ca you can't you well. can't address this very detailed subject in just two shows. Sure. But it's, it's it's food for thought. And my encouragement to the Muslims and to the non-Muslims, especially to the Muslims, is to you know challenge the existing narrative at the moment because yeah. I do feel that it's quite dangerous. And yes, I myself was responsible for it too. But we need to change. We need to be sincere. And we need to basically have more robust narratives. Yes. And that's why we should challenge as many people as possible in a positive way with good adab, with good etiquette and akhlaq and respect and love and, and compassion. So we could have a more robust narrative that allows the Quran to speak yeah. for itself. Yeah, I think that's that's perfectly summed up. Like you said, there's a lot more to it, but I think it gives people a taste of what's going on. Yeah, for sure. Just to conclude, the last 30 seconds, what would you say, how can people take this information and now popularize it, get it out to others so they can actually start using this and not make the mistakes that were made in the past, basically? Well, firstly, what they can do is understand this new approach further, read the essay that we've provided, listen to this show again, speak to the scholars, speak to people who know, and maybe podcast, write their own essays, do their own videos, challenge the people who are articulating the so-called scientific miracles claim, because I think it misrepresents the Quran and it also misrepresents science. And once they challenge that, and yes, you know, don't be rude, be nice, you know, be polite. And I believe that we would allow the Qur'an to speak for itself and we will revive the spiritual nature of the Qur'an which was the main reason for the Qur'an to make us realize that God deserves to be worshipped well, there's, some, there's some kind of scientific details in this book, there isn't The Qur'an is there to make you think about reality to conclude that he deserves to be worshipped and that's the focus but what we've done, we've shifted it away to hey, have you seen this word? it's so amazing, look at this, it's fantastic and their faith hangs on this thin thread yep. on science you can't do that because the beauty of science is that that thread is supposed to break all the time yeah. because it's supposed to change that's the beauty of science that's yeah. why we discover new things that's why we have new approaches that's why we have new theories that's why we have new conclusions because we do more science more observation we get more data and we have different conclusions yeah. so the point is you can't you can't see the Quran that way yeah. it's a very dangerous way of basing your entire faith and not that it's inconsistent, it's not robust and it's incoherent and I think it is probably one of the main reasons for a lot of people actually leaving Islam because they haven't understood the Quran properly because we've given them the wrong type of understanding we've yeah. given them the wrong lenses to understand the Quran right. but I think it's time to change that now inshallah Everyone we, have to, yes, we, have, to we have to change it, we have to change it and I mean I was, I was doing webinars on this for the I've been doing webinars and seminars on this for the past few years yeah. I think three years now, two and a half years and it's hard. You, yeah. It's hard to change it. The reason we want to do these shows is for people to adopt this further and for us to basically move forward as a community and be more robust. Yes. But, you know, it's a lonely space at the moment. I think not... I mean, there are a lot of people who agree with us, yeah. but we need more voices. We need more, we need more loudspeakers to adopt this. I sent my essay to Sheikh Akram Nadwi. He said it should be translated into the main Muslim languages. Oh. He loved it. He sent it to his students. I sent it to Ustad Nurman Ali Khan, he sent it to his students and his and his people um, and Nurman Ali Khan I, th I believe adopts this approach now Abdurrahim Green adopts this approach now so you know there's there's a slow slowly but surely changing narrative and if you want to summarize the whole narrative Allah is Al Hakim, He is the wise, He has the picture, we just have the pixel. Whatever we know, we're going to catch up to the divine knowledge. Inshallah. So, hopefully, this has been beneficial. Jazakallah here, Brother Hamza, for coming on and doing this. And inshallah, stay tuned, share the video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And once again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.